Well, thanks again for joining us at Cornerstone Church Colchester. It's it's great that you've joined us uh, to listen to this week's sermon. And um, I'm going to um, give the first half of the reading, and uh, you'll see from the recording that I read the rest of uh, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. So I'm going to read Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 14 um, to 28, and then I'll continue the reading uh, before I bring God's word uh, to us in the sermon. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days that shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosened the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. <coughs> well, one of the dangers of trying to uh, split up bits of the Bible before you really understand them is you realise you've got it wrong <laughs> by the time you come to prepare. So I'm just going to read to the end of Peter's sermon because I think we need to see that as a whole. And then I'll pray and we'll, we'll go into our time together. So picking up from verse 29, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptised, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to the Lord. Let's just pray, shall we, as we come to God's word. Father, we thank you and praise you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he is indeed 
raised from the dead, exalted at your right hand, ruling now, that he has poured out the Holy Spirit on your people, the church, and by your spirit you are with us now. Lord, please be our teacher, Lord Jesus. Please, by your Holy Spirit, give us understanding. We know that I can't speak, we can't hear without your spirit being at work. So please be at work and glorify your son. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've <coughs> seen the film Don't Look Up. Has anybody seen the film Don't Look Up? It's just me and Min then. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> this illustration is not going to work as well. It's a new film, isn't it? It is quite a new film. I, I do think it's worth seeing. It's, 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 quite, a, it's, quite, a popular, yeah, it's quite a popular film. And I, I think it's a bit of a parable for our times. And I'm thinking, how am I going to talk about this without being a spoiler? Um, <laughs> The, the idea of the film is that scientists discover there's an asteroid heading towards Earth and it's going to obliterate the Earth. And, and these scientists start to get the message out. And uh, it, it's very much about how our culture is, is very, very bad at truth. And so the don't look up becomes a sort of a conspiracy theory. Don't look up at the asteroid that's coming to destroy the Earth. That's just the media sort of trying to deflect you from getting on with what you will enjoy in life. I'll leave you to see the film. But the, the, the phrase is, don't look up. Don't look at the impending doom. Don't look up. And uh, it's really a, a film about the corruption of the media, the corruption of our society, how, how people are very, very bad at believing truth. And... Uh, the world is obliterated and, um, and very few escape. There you go, I've just spoiled the film for you. <laughs> now, as, as Mim and I watched it, I, I think we, we sort of reflected on it afterwards. That there's, there's lots of parallels with where we find ourselves as Christians. We believe that, that Jesus Christ really is alive, that he really is exalted in heaven, he really is coming again. And yet we look out on a world that finds grappling with this truth pretty much impossible. The challenge seems so impossible. But I think if we were to summarise what's going on in this chapter of Acts, it's that God can help people to look up. God can help people to see the impending doom. And he's poured out the Holy Spirit for that purpose, so that people call out and are saved. We've seen already, haven't we, that the, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on each and every Christian. We saw that at the beginning of chapter 2. Uh, the, every Christian has started to declare the works of God in other languages, and a crowd has gathered for the noise, and then some are just saying, oh, they're just drunk. That's all that's going on. And so Peter starts to explain what is actually going on in verse 14. He stands up lifts up his voice, empowered by the Spirit, and dresses them, men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Presumably that wasn't a common occurrence in Jerusalem for people to be drunk <coughs> at nine o'clock in the morning. But then at the end of the, the section, this is why I've changed my mind over the section, or towards the end, in verse 33, He's still explaining this, verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So he's explaining, he's continuing to explain this event. But also, the prophecy of Joel is sort of shot through, the language is shot through in verse 39, we'll look at it a bit later on. When, when Peter says, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself, he's still quoting the prophet Joel, as we'll see. So this is a unit and two things that we're going to learn this morning that Peter was explaining. Firstly, the Holy Spirit has been poured out so that all God's people can prophesy the end. So that includes you and I. So that all God's people can prophesy the end. And the Holy Spirit has been poured out because Jesus has been raised and exalted. So repent. Because Jesus is king, everyone should repent. So firstly, so that all God's people can prophesy the end. That's why the Holy Spirit's been poured out on the day of Pentecost. That's why he's been given to the church. So verse 16, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. 
and in the last days, in other words, that time between Jesus' first and his second coming, uh, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. See, Peter takes up this prophecy of Joel, Joel was a prophet speaking before the exile, warning of the coming judgment of God on Jerusalem, uh, a judgment that points forward to the final judgment. And, and the language makes it clear. Everybody beyond the judgment of Israel, when this new age comes, will prophesy. Men and women, sons and daughters, young and old, the least in society is what I think male and female servants or slaves means all shall prophesy and the language of seeing visions and dreaming dreams is just the language of old testament prophecy that's what people had when they were speaking for god and so peter is saying look the, the day of pentecost is a day when the spirit is poured out so all god's people can prophesy and you think prophesy i don't I sort of see myself as a prophet Let's not get distracted by all the debates about prophecy and whether it still exists today. The prophecy that Peter is talking about here is something that he explains. Two things to it. It's being able to speak about the day of the Lord and how you're saved from it. That's what the prophecy is that he's talking about. First of all, he talks about the day of the Lord. So it's all there in Joel's prophecy as to what this prophecy is about. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be darkened and will turn to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. So this prophecy that he is talking about is about that day. And Christians, we know that that day is coming, do we not? We know that that great and dreadful and magnificent day will happen. And so we can point people to it and say, look, are you ready for that day? And we also know, verse 29, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We will be safe on that day, will we not? We were thinking about that at um, men's breakfast, looking at Colossians. We can look forward beyond that day to the new creation. We know that on that day we will be saved from the judgment of God. This is the gospel. We're all prophets because we know and believe the gospel and the spirit has been poured out so that we can speak to get other people ready. Now, I think we need to, we just need to dwell on this a little bit. It's not just that we're equipped by the Holy Spirit to speak about Jesus, although that's a good thing to be doing. It is not just that we're equipped to to talk about our experience of forgiveness, although that is part of the Christian life, isn't it? It's a wonderful part of the Christian life, but it means that absolutely all of us, men, women, boys, girls, whatever education or expertise we have, we can all speak about the day of the Lord and being safe on that day. And there's so many illustrations that we could use, couldn't we, of you know, those videos of people driving through the burning land, whether it's Greece or Canada, and they got out just in time. Or conversely, you know, the, the Grenfell Tower, those who were told to stay and then burned to death. This is the perspective, that's where we need to get to in our conversations with those we long to know the Lord Jesus and be safe. It, and I don't think this means that we become sort of insensitive <clears throat> Bible bashers who are sort of screaming through a megaphone or, or not starting where people are at or not starting with good friendships but are we longing to get to that conversation where we talk about that day and being safe on that day because that is the spirit of prophecy that's why the Holy Spirit has been poured out it's not the sort of don't look up narrative where we're just imagining that nobody's going to get what we're talking about because the media have blinded them. No, we, we can encourage people to look up, to call on the Lord, to be safe on that day. And in God's economy, he has equipped each and every one of us, even the tiniest ones of us, 
who trust in him by the Holy Spirit to talk to others about that day and being safe in Jesus. It's a very, very simple message, isn't it? God's coming to judge. We're on the wrong side, but if we trust in Jesus, we are forgiven and given the Holy Spirit. We'll be safe on that day. It's not a, it's not a complicated message. We don't need to know degrees in theology. We just need to know that we've been saved ourselves. Where might this land practically? I don't know what you've... I find it really difficult to get into any conversation with anybody about Christianity. But I, I am comforted sometimes that I, I can use little booklets that have the message, that get on to sin and judgment. This was the booklet that I used. No, no, I didn't use it. No, somebody used it on me. And they said, you know, do you believe God created the world? They went through each picture. You know, do you think you're going to hell? Yes, I wasn't a Christian. Do, do you think that Jesus died on the cross for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and he rose again. Do you want to become a Christian? Yes, I want to become a Christian. Go away and pray the prayer. I went away and prayed the prayer and came back. So I'm obviously a bit of a fan of that booklet for that reason. But it's clear on sin and judgment and being safe on that day. And it's that, it's such a difficult topic to get onto, isn't it? But that is the topic that the Holy Spirit wants us to get onto. That, that's why he was poured out, says Peter. So that's the first thing. The Holy Spirit has been poured out so that all God's people can be prophets in that sense. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit has been poured out because Jesus has been raised and exalted. So repent. So the right response when we hear that we're on the wrong side of God is to repent and get on the right side of God. Now, I got this wrong because I thought there seems to be a change in topic, but it's actually the same topic. So Peter is using language from Joel Let's just keep a finger in, in Acts. I just want to show you this so you know that it is something I'm not just making up. So keep a finger in Acts and we go back to Joel. And maybe somebody shout out the page number when we get there. So 762 it will be because we're in chapter 2. And I just want you to see this so that you can see how the whole of Peter's sermon has got this future orientation. And it, it makes sense as to why he calls them to repentance because... Well, if you just crucified the Lord of glory, you're not on the right side of God, are you? So, chapter 2, verse 30, you'll see that's where he's been quoting from. And then, verse 32, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Same language as we see in chapter 2 of Acts, verse 39. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So Peter's on the same theme. And what he's saying is that Jesus has been raised and, and exalted and is coming to defeat all his enemies. Let's just see this. I'll, I'll go quite quickly because we'll be returning to this next week. Verse 22. Men of Israel. Hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, so judgment's coming because the wonders are happening on earth. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Which, which side were you on, fellow Jews, fellow Israelites, when God sent his Messiah? You crucified him. Where does that leave you? Verse 24, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. He quotes and says, Psalm 16 has been fulfilled, fellow Israelites. And then he quotes Psalm 2, as it prophesies the exaltation of Christ to God's right hand. Verse 32, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we're all witnesses. We've seen Jesus dead, we've seen him alive. He is the Messiah, he's God's son, he's been raised to the highest place. We, we've seen it all. Verse 33, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you are now seeing and hearing. This is what this means. Little aside, these things go together. Jesus' resurrection, exaltation, pouring out of the Holy Spirit. So it can only happen once. Because Jesus was only raised and exalted and enthroned in heaven once. 
poured out the Holy Spirit. And then he says, verse 36, for David did not ascend into heaven, but he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Here's the sucker punch. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, the Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified. So what are you can do about it, house of Israel? He, he's enthroned in heaven and he's making all his enemies his footstool. He's going to crush all those who are against him. See, rather than the church being a prisoner to the power of the media, the gullibility of people, their preponderance for lies and dismissal of the truth to their own destruction, the Holy Spirit enables Peter to speak in such a way that people have their sin confronted and they repent and 3,000 people join the church. This is the power we need, is it not? If the gospel and its progress in this nation is going to be turned around, this, this is what needs to be happening, is it not? But here's the challenge for me and for all of us. Which narrative do we have in our minds? The don't look up narrative? Or that God is now at power in his working in the world because Jesus is his Christ. So that people will look up when they're warned of the judgment to come. They will call out. They will repent. And they will be saved. This is the narrative of Acts. But we may say, as I close, how? How, how can we live more in this narrative where our confidence is that as we warn people of the judgment to come, they will call out and be saved? Because it happens so rarely, doesn't it? Or is that just me? How are we going to live in the world of acts more than the world of don't look up? You're really going to have to watch the film so that you can understand what the heck I'm going on about. <laughs> Well, the apostles in the early church devoted themselves to prayer in the days up to Pentecost. I think that's a clue, isn't it? They gathered for prayer when the Holy Spirit filled them afresh and sent them out with boldness. And what do they do in verse 42, straight after this sermon of Peter's? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. I've said before, I think I've been trained very well in how to speak. You, you may think otherwise, but I think, you know, at <laughs> Cornhill and all that kind of thing. I think the, 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 that's that training in our constituency, isn't there? But nobody's ever sat down with me and talked with me about how important as a minister my life of prayer is. Never. I think that has to change in my life. I think it has to change in all our lives. If we are going to be a community in which the spirit is at work and we are emboldened to warn people of the judgment to come, which will be costly, because people don't like that. I mean, Jerusalem didn't like the apostles trying to make them guilty for crucifying Jesus. They put them in prison. If we're going to have the spirit's work amongst us, I think we need his help. We, we need to devote ourselves to prayer as a community, to devote ourselves to one another, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to the prayers. And then maybe, according to God's mercy to us, we can grow in this prophetic ministry, the truly prophetic ministry of warning people of the judgment to come, and then calling on the name of the Lord and being saved. Even just three people doing that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? Let alone 3,000. Let, let's pray. Let's just commit ourselves to this. Let's not let this sort of go from our hearts and minds. Let's be thinking and talking about how we can devote ourselves to prayer more individually and, and as a community, depending on the spirit that we might be prophets in the true sense of that word. Father, we thank you that you have poured out your Holy Spirit on your people the church we thank you lord jesus that you have sent your holy spirit on your people so that we can speak forgive us lord for ways in which we grieve your holy spirit ways in which we depend on other powers other narratives 
rather than this narrative, this power that you have brought into our hearts and into our lives. Please help us, Lord, to know how we can devote ourselves to prayer, devote ourselves to one another in the fellowship so that in time we might be indeed filled by the Spirit and enabled in his power to bring the gospel to others. And we pray this for the glory of Jesus. Amen.